Hello, my name is Dr. Joy O'Keefe. I'm director of the Center for Bat Research, Outreach, and Conservation at Indiana State University. My students and I conduct a lot of research on bats, working in the Midwest and Southeastern United States. I love to talk about bats, and today we'll share with you some of what I know about bat houses, artificial roosts built by people to provide habitat for bats. You might ask, why should I care about bats? While you will undoubtedly learn this from other parts of Mammoth Cave's Bat Night event, I will give you a few important reasons. One reason bats matter so much to us is because they eat animals we are often less fond of, insects. All of the bats that occur at Mammoth Cave National Park are insectivorous, and in fact, most bats in the world eat insects. This makes sense because insects are small and they're abundant at night when bats are flying. The northern long-eared bat that I showed you on the previous slide has a very diverse diet consuming tens to hundreds of different types of insects each summer. In a diet study conducted by my student, Tim, we determined that the main kinds of insects this bat eats are the five shown here. From top left, crane flies, those big bumbling mosquito-like insects you see at night. Next up, mosquitoes. Yes, bats do eat mosquitoes. At the bottom left is a small midge fly. These types of flies are third on the list. Mosquitoes and midge flies bite humans and animals like cows. Then we have the tiny moths in the middle here, and then the, two, the leaf hoppers that are shown on the bottom right. These two species are plant pests. They eat crops and they eat forest trees. Without a healthy, healthy bat population, it could be very uncomfortable to be out at night with all the mosquitoes and flies biting you, and our crops and forest plants would be less healthy too. Despite their value to us, bats are in trouble. Most of the species that we find in Mammoth Cave are imperiled due to disease, habitat loss, or other threats. For example, white nose syndrome, a disease caused by a non-native fungal species, has decimated populations of bats that hibernate in the large caves in the park during the winter. See the tight cluster of hibernating Indiana bats pictured at left? The fungus can attack and quickly spread among the hibernating cluster of bats like this one, while they are deep in sleep and unable to fight off the fungus. This fungus eats away at wing tissue and causes the bats to wake up repeatedly during the winter. Thus, they burn through valuable fat reserves and may starve to death before spring arrives. On the right, you will see a hoary bat, which has a very different strategy for surviving the winter. Just like many bird species, in the fall, the hoary bat flies south to warmer climates. Along the way, it now encounters many wind turbines. Encounters are often fatal for hoary bats and two other migratory bat species. Sadly, we don't know if these losses are sustainable, as we do not know how many hoary bats existed before we began installing wind turbines. Habitat loss, particularly the loss of forests and clean streams, is also a major issue for bats. So for these reasons, we would like to do what we can to help bats and installing bat houses could be one way to help. Finally, a very good reason to protect bats is that bats are just really cool. There are over 1,400 species of bats in the world. They represent almost one quarter of all mammal species and are arguably the coolest and most diverse group of mammals. The Raffinesque big-eared bat pictured here is a resident in Mammoth, Mammoth Cave National Park. This bat uses its large ears to detect the sounds of moths moving their wings as they sit on leaves in the forest. How cool is that? When they hibernate, Raffinesque's big-eared bats fold those huge ears down over their backs to use them like a blanket. Perhaps you want to help these cool critters out by creating a home for them. You would not be alone. Bat houses are a major wildlife interest area around the world. The earliest bat houses built in the early 1900s were designed to hold thousands of bats. The house pictured at left is an example of this kind of a house. Seeing as this mimics a human dwelling, this could actually be very good, a very good house for some bat species, particularly those that like living in large colonies. And I'll show you an example of a species that does this a little later on. The roosts on the right are examples of bat boxes installed on the sides of live trees in the early 1990s. 
While we now know that live trees aren't always an ideal location for a bat box, we did not know that then. I'll give you some tips on where to place your bat houses later in this presentation. Before you build a bat box, you should know what types of bats will use it. Not all bat species will use a house made by humans. Whether or not they find a bat house to be favorable will depend on the species preferences for natural roosts. The first group of bats likely to use a bat house is bats that naturally roost in cavities or under the sloughing bark of a dead or dying tree. I've shown some examples of natural bat roosts here. The tree on the left is a dead shortleaf pine tree that housed a colony of Indiana bats in Great Smoky Mountains National Park. The tree in the middle is a maple tree that was damaged during a timber harvest on a natural, national forest. And this tree served as a roost for a small colony of northern long-eared bats. And the tree on the right is a recently dead shagbark hickory that was used by Indiana bats in central Indiana. These tiny bats fit into tiny crevices in these trees, and they like to pack together in groups called maternity colonies during the summer. While I'm only showing you one eastern small-footed bat at left and one Indiana bat at right, it is not uncommon for tens or hundreds of these bats to cram into a natural roost like a dead tree. In a maternity colony, which roosts together from about April to late September, there are adult females that may or may not be related to each other. Each female typically has one pup. She becomes pregnant in April, just after leaving the site where she hibernated for the winter. Two months later, she gives birth to her pup. Some species do give birth to more than one pup. The pup develops for about a month after birth before taking its first flight. Then we notice that the colony swells in size when we count the bats emerging from their roosts. After the pups are capable of flight, all the bats in the colony focus on eating a lot to put on fat for winter before finally migrating to their wintering site. Not all of the, bat box, or the bats that use bat houses are tiny. Indeed, the largest bat in Florida, the Florida bonneted bat, is a frequent bat house user. Adult bonneted bats weigh 40 to 65 grams, which is about four to six times larger than the tiny bats I just showed you. This rather large endangered bat is endemic to Southern Florida, meaning that is the only place in the world where it is found. Interestingly, we observe it in bat houses more often than in natural roosts. Its natural roosts are in cavities in pine trees. And while it is a large bat, it does not roost in large maternity colonies like the species that I just mentioned. Instead, it forms a harem of several females and usually one adult male who must defend his harem against other males, thus the small colony size. Because of the bat's large size, it is important to place the bat house high above the ground so the emerging bats can catch air as they drop out of the roost at night. And this is also important for any other bat house, although the height varies depending on the size of the bats that inhabit the house. Another group of bats that will use bat houses and buildings actually, is bats that are naturally inclined to roost in very large trees with very large hollows. As humans have altered our landscapes, these types of trees have become really uncommon. In fact, it is very rare for us to find a bat using such a tree unless we are working in swampy areas where large damaged trees tend to be more common. While these large hollow trees were once found along major rivers in the Midwest, we've mostly cleared those trees away to make way for agriculture. The big brown bat is an example of a species adapted for using large hollow trees. Ironically, as humans cleared away the big trees these bats depended on, we built up other structures in which they could roost. Houses, particularly attics, and barns. If you or someone you know has bats in their belfry, odds are it is a colony of big brown bats. This is a very adaptable species that is found across almost all of North America. Accordingly, it is also one of our most common bat house users. Big brown bats are about twice the size of the smaller bats I showed earlier. They like to roost in large colonies, sometimes hundreds of bats. 
Therefore, if you are trying to provide a home for big brown bats, you may need to build a bigger bat house. The final group of bats to discuss is those species that roost in caves during the summer. One in particular that you may have heard of is the Mexican free-tailed bat. This species is well known for roosting in large colonies in rather large caves across the southwestern United States and of course ranges down into Central and South America. Pictured here is Bracken Cave in Texas, which houses literally millions of free-tailed bats during the warmer months of the year. Some of you may have visited Carlsbad Caverns National Park, where half a million or more free-tailed bats depart from one of the park's caves each night. The free-tailed bat has been expanding its range across the southern United States in recent years. Like the big brown bat, this species has taken a liking to roosting in man-made structures, typically buildings, which it finds to be a suitable surrogate for cave roosts. But unlike the big brown bat, the free-tailed bat will roost in colonies of thousands or even millions of bats. So a standard bat house is not going to be sufficient for this species. Recall the very first bat house I showed you, the very tall structure that looked like a building. Such a structure was designed for housing a very large colony of free-tailed bats. Do those structures work? Stay tuned for the answer to that question. Now that you know which types of bats you could attract to your bat house, let's look at the type of structures that we know will work for bats. Bat houses made of wood are often successful. Pictured at left is a rocket box design where bats have access to the roost on all four sides. This roost is meant to mimic a tree, giving bats options for roosting high or low, on the south side or on the east side, according to their preference. The box in the middle is also a wooden rocket box with both an outer and an inner chamber. The roost is built around a wooden four by four inch post. It's critical to use untreated wood when building bat houses, as the bats will press right up against the wood while they are roosting for up to 15 hours a day. Research in Europe has shown that treated wood can be toxic to bats, so we always avoid it when building bat houses. The roosts on the right are flat-faced boxes with multiple chambers, also made of wood. At the end of the presentation, I'll give you a link to a website where you can find a plan for a bat house similar to this one. Note that these houses are not built around a post, which also makes them easier to install. In fact, some people install these flat-faced bat houses on the sides of buildings or two on a post as pictured. Another thing to note is that all of these boxes are relatively large with room to hold tens to hundreds of bats. Oftentimes, the bat houses that I see in stores are very small. This means they're unlikely to be suitable for housing a full-size maternity colony of big brown bats or Indiana bats, for example. Now recall the free-tailed bat that lives in extremely large colonies. Scale the wooden rocket or flat-faced boxes up quite a bit and you'll have yourself a box fit for free-tailed bats. This structure pictured here contains many, many crevices accessible from underneath the box. It was built on the campus of University of Florida in Gainesville to accommodate free-tailed bats that were evicted from a building that was torn down. It took three years for bats to occupy the first house after it was built. Now, about 20 years later, the free-tailed bats have two structures to choose from, and about a half a million bats live in these extremely large bat houses. Another type of bat house is one that mimics a natural roost more directly. The pictured here is a bark mimic roost made from a rubbery material that uh, stretches around a telephone pole to provide a space for bats to roost underneath. I don't recommend that the typical homeowner make a roost from rubber, as there are important aspects to consider regarding design and how the roost is installed to keep the bats safe. Finally, I wanna share a roost style I came across in Northeastern Spain a few years ago. Researchers there were testing out different styles of bat houses. This one was built simply from clay wrapped around the contour of a round post. The first layer, which is pressed against the post, has a landing pad where bats can alight and then crawl up into the box. And if you look carefully there, you'll see little hatch marks etched into the clay. These tiny grooves in the clay will provide footholds for the bats while at roost. Clay roosts and shorter roosts like this one 
may hold fewer bats, but they'll also be less prone to overheating than larger roosts. I want to tell you about a few important aspects that you could sh should consider when designing and building a bat box or a bat house. First up, the material. If you're going to build a bat house from wood, as most of you will, then I recommend you use solid wooden boards or planks. Pictured on the left is a house made of pine boards. You can see that we scuffed up the wood with the back of a hammer. You could also cut shallow grooves with a saw if you have the time. I do not recommend using plywood, which you can see at center, as it tends to degrade pretty quickly and the glue that holds it together could also be harmful to bats. I also do not recommend using plastic or composite wood as we have tested it against real wood and found it is less suitable for bats from a thermal perspective. Cypress or oak or hickory would be ideal woods to use to build a bat house as they're likely the longest lasting woods. However, pine boards will also work well. I also don't recommend using cedar, even though I often see commercial houses built from this type of wood, as it tends to be smelly and this could dissuade bats from using a bat house structure. The next thing to consider is what color the bat house will be. The best color will vary according to the climate that you're in. In a warmer and drier climate, I recommend a very light color or not painting the bat house at all. In a colder climate where the summer highs are rarely above 80 degrees Fahrenheit, a very dark or even black, black bat house should work well. Also, when you paint a box, use latex non-volatile paint to coat only the outside of the box and the roof you do not need to paint any of the inside of the house. A few other things to know about the bat house interior. As noted earlier, scuff the wood to provide footholds for the bats. You can see that the roost on the right has plastic screening stapled inside to provide a place for bats to grab onto. I'm not a fan of this method as that plastic will come loose over time, thus blocking the entryway or leaving no place for the bats to hang onto if it falls out of the box. If you can make a house with multiple chambers, you could use a one inch drill bit to create a pass through hole, sand down the sides of the hole after you drill it. And importantly, for most bats in North America, the width of each chamber should be three quarter inch. An easy way to set the widths is to use blocks of wood as spacers between the sections which you can see in the internal structure of the rocket box that is shown on the left side. In our research, we have found that vents are a critical component of a successful bat house. Vents allow the hot air to escape, which can cool a box down on a particularly hot day. You can see that we installed a box with such a vent on two sides with the box pictured at left. I labeled the vent in case you were confused about which hole we put in the side of the box. A couple years after this roost was installed, a woodpecker decided to put another hole in the side of the box. Tricked him, right? Well, interestingly enough, this box is a favored roost by a colony of Indiana bats in central Indiana. So there might be something to adding extra holes or vents, particularly for hot summers. We also experimented with adding a chimney to a roost, as you can see in the box in the picture on the right. A chimney design is more stable and less likely to overheat than a bat box without any vents, as shown by some research conducted by my student, Frank. Now that you've built your bat house, where should you install it? As I mentioned, the side of a building could be a logical place to install a bat house. Just make sure it isn't on the north side of the house. Bats do like it to be warm in their summer roosts. Also, don't put it near any night lights as this will deter bats from roosting there. The roost must be high enough that bats can drop into flight. I recommend at least 12 to 15 feet off the ground. And be aware that if you install a bat house on your house, you may have some unwanted guano or bat poop staining down the side of your house but this guano just means the bats are eating more of your pesky insects. And that guano does make great fertilizer for your garden. If you want a more natural setting, then you can install the bat house on a post in a sunny location. 
I recommend concreting the post in for stability and put the house relatively close to a tree line as we find that bats emerging from bat houses often go straight to the trees when they first emerge, probably to escape potential predators. We've been experimenting with put, putting bat houses in clusters of different styles to learn what their preferences are. My student Julia did a two year experiment putting out bat boxes in clusters. You might try this too, or at least put two houses on the same post back to back to give bats more options. If your property affords this, you could also put bat houses up in different locations. Perhaps one location receives morning sun and one receives afternoon sun. We have data to suggest that bats will use bat houses with different solar exposures during different parts of the summer, as evidenced by a study being conducted by my student Reed. We often see bats switching between natural roost structures too, so there's fairly strong evidence that one roost cannot meet all of the needs of a colony over the course of the entire season. So we put these roosts up in clusters in one of our study area, and if you look at this cluster picture, you can see that all of these clusters are within about a half a kilometer of each other, and all of them were used by bats during our study. If you build a bat house and go to the effort of putting it up, will bats use it? The odds are more in your favor if you already have a colony of bats using a building or another type of artificial roost that is nearby. Also, you need to have the right kinds of bats in the area, those that are more inclined to roost in bat houses. And finally, you will have to be patient. It could take years for a colony to find and begin using a well-designed bat house. Recall that it took three years for the colony of free-tailed bats to begin using the boxes on the campus of the University of Florida, and now there are about a half a million bats in those houses. If there's sufficient natural roosting habitat nearby, such as large trees with shaggy bark or dead trees with sloughing patches of bark like those cottonwoods on the right, then bats may select those natural roosts over your bat house. Don't feel bad. Perhaps there's a better place you could put your bat house, like a park or more of an urban setting where a bat house may be more attractive to bats. There are other ways that you can help bats that don't involve carpentry, if that's not your thing. If you attended bat night and heard from me and other researchers, then you are undoubtedly more of an expert on bats than you were yesterday. Please share this knowledge with others and help to get other people excited about our night flying friends. You can also protect and enhance natural areas for bats by doing a few simple things. Plant flowers that will attract moths and other insects to provide food for bats. Provide clean water sources. These need to be larger than a bird bath, but can be smaller than a swimming pool. And plant trees that will provide food for insects and eventually natural roosts for colonies of bats. For bat house plants, please visit the website of the Center for Bat Research, Outreach, and Conservation at Indiana State University. You'll find plans for a rocket box and a flat-faced box. Thanks for listening, and thanks for your interest in bats.